Lying at the heart of historic Virginia is the Red Loam County of Albemarle with its picturesque courthouse city of Charlottesville. Nature has smiled on this favored Piedmont section with its fertile rolling hills and its restful landscapes dotted by general farms and orchards of fruit. Cattle pause within these well-watered barns to be fatted for the market. Below a towering Norwegian pine, sheep graze. And here men whose lives changed history have weaned or slumbered. Such were the inseparable friends, Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe. Their shrines stand today, an inspiration to thousands who come to pay homage each year. It was to this captivating region that James Monroe, fifth president of our country, was drawn in 1799. Today, the heroic Picarivi statue of Monroe preserves the cherished atmosphere of those years which saw the birth of the far-reaching Monroe Doctrine. His hilltop home of Ashlawn still nestles amid the quiet dignity and charm of its famous boxwood garden, started by Monroe himself a century and a half ago with tiny plants brought from England. Winds whisper through the ivy-covered ash trees of the leisurely, self-sufficient plantation life of old, of Negro servants, home-fashioned yokes and spinning wheels. Surrounded by the deep red buds of the Judas tree, Ashlawn, mellowed by passing years and changing owners, has now become a permanent shrine to honor the greatness of its builder. Here today is being recreated Monroe's cabin castle, designed by his close friend Thomas Jefferson, whose home, Monticello, can be seen from the arched doorway of Ashlawn. It, too, stands on a hilltop. Quiet simplicity of white columns against red brickwork marks Monticello as one of the noblest homes ever built by man. Few shrines in America are so much a part of the builder, for Jefferson was more than a founding father of a democratic government, the author of the Declaration of Independence and a champion of religious freedom, he was an architect, a collector, and an inventor. His famous compass, attached as it was to a weather vane above, could be conveniently read in the ceiling of the east portico of Monticello. Standing 300 feet above any of the surrounding country, Monticello has become world famous. And here the lovely red flowering dogwood is the glory of the woods in springtime. The graceful lines of Monticello have long since become a perfect example of early American architecture. The pleasant use of columned porticos, a dome somewhat concealed by a balustrade, subterranean passages to unnoticed slave quarters and stables make for the peaceful harmony which blends so well with carpets of green and beds of red tulips. Jefferson himself was the meticulous architect and landscaper and early became known as the first American who consulted the fine arts to know how he should shelter himself from the weather. A dislike for the colonial architecture of the period, which had come from England, as was customary, naturally turned his thoughts to the classic architecture of Greece and Rome. He worked long hours in his small law office, which is perched on the edge of a cliff, like a post at the end of the North Terrace. Architecture became his lifelong hobby, influenced mostly by Andrea Palladio, the 16th century Italian architect, whose models furnished the background for a practical colonial mansion. But the architecture of Jefferson is no more wholly Palladian than it might be Georgian. It is typically Jeffersonian architecture. We say today, a natural American design. And Jefferson has become one of the few great architects ever produced in America. His terraces, concealed scenes of great activity in those olden days. And underneath the North Terrace lie the stables, the ice house, and the bath. Jefferson's life was one of sincere loves, his country, his fellow man, his architecture. But the romantic love which he held for Martha, his fair complexioned wife, became one of the motivating forces of his life. Quaint Honeymoon Lodge at the end of the South Terrace today symbolizes this devotion. Here great happiness was theirs for ten years, when Martha died untimely. Her death tragically staggered Jefferson, 
though the years to come were to see his rise from a ministership to France to Secretary of State, climaxed by the presidency of the United States in 1801. Stately Monticello is indeed a rich heritage and majestic patriotic shrine, and had it been Jefferson's only contribution, his fame would still live on. But scarcely three miles northeast of Monticello, near Charlottesville, lies the spacious campus of the University of Virginia. Here, Jefferson captured queenly grandeur as he worked out the architectural details for the university. These gave the campus one of the noblest edifices of any institution of learning, the Rotunda. Today, more than 3,000 youths study and stroll mid matchless colonnades, pavilions and dormitory ranges fronted by arcades, and huge quadrangles of lawn brooded over by luxuriant and noble columns of elm trees. Today, as we wind past great lawns and through hedge roadways, a progressive institution stands before us. Modern dormitories house students, and gymnastic facilities abound to steal 20th century youths for their tasks. Physics and mechanical laboratories, renowned law and medical schools, libraries, classrooms have expanded to proportions undreamed of by their founder. Jefferson's vision of life, bulwarked by active participation of Monroe and James Madison, has become the ideal atmosphere for scholarship and learning. His tradition is still there, steeped in liberality and the character of the South. The great educational institution founded by Jefferson is truly a permanent living shrine to its far-seeing creator. As it was his earliest concern, so it was his last public interest. Today, he stands in statue guarding the entrance of the rotunda he loved so well. Surely the exalted lives of Monroe and Jefferson live on as the rich heritage which they left to man is nurtured and guarded on a university campus of such unsurpassed beauty.